right, people. Here we go. Ian McKay and Ian McKay and Wayne Kramer. Hi, everybody. Um, well, we're two guys in chairs. Um, well, I think we were. I was supposed to interview Seth Hurwitz, who does IMP Productions, but. Did you tell him what's happened already, Kristen? Did she tell you what happened? He's sick. So Wayne and I are going to talk with you guys if you want to talk, or we can have an impromptu Quaker meeting. You decide. <laughs> we thought if there was anything that um, troubled you or anything that you ever wanted to ask us, um, there's nothing that uh, personally that I consciously remember that I won't talk about. So this is on you. Oh, that's right. You have to talk into a mic because there's What's that? webcasting yeah. happening. All right, who's got a hand up? This guy was, he's, he was quick. Which one? This guy. That guy, yeah. Wayne, elaborate on the project you spoke about last night, please. On, uh, on, your, on your, yeah, your new nonprofit project. Yeah. I've partnered with Billy Bragg on an initiative that he uh, pioneered in England a couple years ago. It's called Jail Guitar Doors, and it's based on a Clash song um, about my misadventures as a younger man that landed me in federal prison for a couple years. Uh, the Clash wrote, they were gracious enough to write this song about a fellow musician. And um, Billy decided to use the title as the name of an initiative. And what he did in England and what I've taken on in America is to take uh, musical instruments into prisons for the purposes of rehabilitation through the power of music itself. The idea being that we can provide them with guitars and that they can, in a meditative way, learn how to express themselves in a non-confrontational way. It's, it's really a profound thing that happens when you sit alone with a guitar and you figure out how to say something. I, I know what it did to me. I suspect it may have done the same to Ian and anybody that, that sits and works on an instrument. And it's the beginning of building some self-esteem. It's the beginning of building some integrity in yourself. I'm not encouraging prisoners to go into the music business. The, I, I wouldn't encourage anybody to go into the music <laughs> business. <laughs> but I'm saying that there's a profound thing that can happen in the, in the, in the, with the opportunity of, of prison. And, and uh, you know, the idea being you know, to start to learn ways to not come back to prison. I think it's important, just on the note about business, music business, Music and music business are not synonymous. It's not always Correct. the same thing. I think that's often a big, a big problem. A lot of times people will want to talk to me about music, and they ask me questions about music business. I'm like, well, hold on. Let's, let's clear this up. So I think that's it's a really good point, that music is actually, I always say, it's a form of communication that predates language. It's just no fucking joke. It's straight up. So um, the idea of music being, a, of course, being a, a therapy or something that people can focus on, in my life, that was certainly the case. And I think that exists, has always existed, always will exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're not reinventing the wheel here. No. This is, this is an a ancient idea. But, you know, we're in such a, a catastrophe in corrections in the, the world of prison uh, in America today. There's two and a half million people in prison, our fellow brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, cousins. And half of them are nonviolent drug offenders. They have no business being in prison. When you send someone to prison, that's a profound act. And it's something we really need, need as a nation, as people, need to take a look at. So, you know, I, I feel like this is something I can do. I'm uniquely positioned halfway between the world of prison and, and the world of music. And it's, it's work that I, you know, that I can do. I, I can't do everything. I have limited power. But this is a little uh, something I can do. Hmm. Hi. Hey, my name is Tim Anderson. I'm from Old Dominion University. Uh, I have a question for Ian. Um, we're sitting here, and we were just having a conversation about how frustrating it is 
not to have, uh, when somebody says, you know, what are the, the terms of, of business that you have with musicians? And they say, well, we can't talk about that. We can't be transparent about our business dealings and how somebody gets paid. And it seems like one of the things that Discord is always about is the level of transparency. Could you talk about like how important that is for the musicians you deal with to know exactly when the money comes in and how you pay them out, that, you know, that, that, how that transparency operates, not only as an ethical p principle, but also as good business? I think that part of the situation with Discord, which it make, maybe makes it unique, is that coming from Washington, D.C., and being kids when we started, and we started, December will be our 29th year as a label, and I'm 47, so you can do the math. We were kids when we started this company. In Washington, D.C., there, is, there was no established music business. There was no template. We had no idea of what we were, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We were essentially just trying to document something that was important to us. So when we first started, we were learning as we went along. We just made something. Okay, we made a record. We sent a tape. We sent some money to some people in Nashville, Tennessee. We got back a box of, you know, seven-inch records. And then we took the, the cover of another single, and we just unfolded it and we put it on an 11 by 17 piece of paper and you know, traced the outline of it and then put our own pictures in the tracing. We took that to a print shop, had them print a thousand of those, and then we're using scissors. We cut each one out and we folded each one. We did this for the first 10,000 records, you know, by hand. We made each one by hand. We didn't know any other way, but what that gave us was an opportunity to really um, learn and to craft, like we just didn't learn from people who had perfected the art of ripping people off. What we had learned was how to make records, and to make records, you need to have music. And to have music, you have to have musicians, so why would you screw the, this necessary relationship? So our point of view was, we're not going to have contracts. We've never had contracts. Um, I don't have a lawyer. I don't, you know, I've never, I don't, we don't, if you don't have contracts, you don't really need a lawyer. No offense to the lawyers, but you know. I mean, contracts are only relevant in a court of law, ultimately. That's when they really don't only have any real weight. So the, the question is, how greedy are you or how far are you going to argue about money? At some point, if someone who I work with is so insistent on the money, I'm like, just take it. You can have whatever you want. I'm not going to go to court over this. It's just not going to happen. Now, this has, in fact, de facto made us a smaller operation. Obviously, we're not, we can't sell millions and millions of records. But cumulatively, we have sold millions of records. But on each one, I know the bigger businesses, you know, you can, those larger, that much money, it just gets crazy. So from our point of view, with, with bands, we tell them it's a 50-50 deal. After the costs are covered, we split the profit with you. And they're always welcome to come check on anything. It's confusing, of course, but we still pay royalties to bands who put out singles in 1981. I have some uh, musicians who have asked me to stop sending them the checks because it just freaks them out that they're still getting like, here's the $32? Let's stop sending it, you know? But I think that <laughs> literally a guy, this is, I ran to a guy who had moved. I said, oh, send me your address so we can keep sending you your check. And he says, you know, those checks are annoying me. And I said, why would they annoy you? And he said, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, he does international real estate or construction or something. And he says, there's just nothing in my, this, I have no way to categorize this that makes any sense. And I said, well, if you just, as, I will stop sending it. And he said, yeah, I've had three different people now ask me, okay, enough. So we started an escrow fund where all their checks go into the escrow fund and then we're gonna give that money to somebody at some point. I think mostly the, the idea of transparency is just, it was just a necessity because that's how we came up. We didn't know any other way, and we never had any other kind of, we never had anybody telling us, well, you need to do this or do that, you know? Oh, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Mosby. I'm a music fan, and um, yesterday I met a, uh, a DC band, and uh, they're high schoolers, and so they're in school right now, and they couldn't be here, so um, one of the, uh, one of the girls asked me to uh, get your card, Ian. <laughs> um, Tell her to look in the phone book. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm in the Arlington, Virginia phone book. She can find me. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Like, if you're a local DC artist and you want to reach out to you, find you in the phone book, call you I'm, up. I live here. I'm around. And you can you go on the website, discord.com. 
You can contact me that way. You can also look in the phone book. I mean, this is the thing. People often say, you don't know how hard I work to get your number. And as far as I know, if you just type my name into a computer, you'll get my number. So <laughs> anybody else? Are we? Huh. Uh, OK, so this is really exciting for me, actually, both of you guys being up on the stage at the same time. And, uh, um, <clears throat> You know, a lot of what I do, I'm a, I'm a musician, a record producer from Philadelphia, and I have a, starting a nonprofit organization called Weathervane Music to sort of try to figure out ways to raise money for artists to cover recording costs, you know, to make good recordings. Um, what, can you, what can you say, Ian, about, uh, you know, how, how you started Discord and, and I know you worked for years with, uh, you know, things would mostly happen around inner ear. I know my band recorded there because of that. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, what, what can you say about the, the recording process as a, as a, you know, sort of as a, an art in and of itself that's important to the future of music? Hmm. Recording? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm inter my recording thing, I'm, I'm <clears throat> I find that with computer recording, I found there's a lot of progress in terms of like, it's so easy to record now and there's so much structure, but. I turned mine off. It's not me. Um, but I have to say that I don't know. Um, I, I find that the ease of recording has somehow made the music less interesting for me. Um, and I think that people underestimate the kind of the power of what I think of as a submarine in recording studios. Like recording at home is great, but there's also something to be said for studios and working with somebody who really knows a room and you're in this submarine for like a few days where you really are focused on recording. But it's also prohibitively expensive. It's a, it's a conundrum. Uh, it's a real conundrum. I actually, I mean, people call me a Luddite. I don't think I'm really a Luddite, but I am, I'm not a cutting edge guy, you know, because I think the cutting edge is a lot of energy goes into technology. And technology, I think, has dominated, in recent years, dominated everything. And it's, it's a distraction, because ultimately, the content suffers. So I record on a eight track cassette. I do that because I want less options, not more. That's me, I'm, I'm weird like that. But it forces me to write songs that are interesting to me, at least, and I hope they're interesting to other people. I think most people go into recording studios or make records and they think, how can I make like a hit or how can I make it sound professional? Don't worry about professional. Worry about it being good. You want people, you want to make remarkable music, you got to get people to remark upon it. That's it. It's just music. It's so, I mean, I don't, I, I'm always going to come back to the same thing. It's just simple. Like people, if they have an idea, if you're a musician, you don't have a choice in the matter, right? Anyone who's a musician in this room, you know, you can't stop from coming out. That's why we're musicians. It doesn't mean we're better than anybody else. It just means that's, that's what we got. And somebody else might be a visual artist, someone might be a writer, someone might be a cook. There's certain things we just can't stop from coming out of us. Music, I can't stop it. I just want to make it come out pure, and I don't want to be distracted by all the technology. I do think that people's, like, this obsession with software, it just becomes insane. I can't get near them because I spend all day just figuring out how to, like, work the software. I just want to write a song. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure, like I can't really speak about recording today other than occasionally someone will take new technology and they will screw with it in a way that they've innovated. And when they innovate, they've created something that adds to the conversation that's worth listening to. Anybody got any questions? Uh, Wayne, you had uh, talked for a few seconds about uh, guitar over here. Uh, guitar as a uh, way to get self-confidence in, 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 in terms of the Jailhouse Project. Um, could you guys talk about your own first instruments and, and, and you know, how you came to be musicians and, and did you learn in school? I mean, did you have music in, in school and, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about the beginnings of your musical adventures? Well, I grew up in the... Uh, <clears throat> Sort of, sort of discovered music in the late 50s and up through the early 60s. Uh, and this was a, the coming of the uh, rock and roll era. And uh, I heard something in the electric guitar 
that I didn't hear in like acoustic guitars. It was a, it was a different sound because it, it had an amplifier and it was, it was an electric sound and I heard things in, uh, in the tone of Dwayne Eddy's guitar or in the velocity of Chuck Berry that um, drew me, that, that compelled me forward. It's, it's like what Ian was saying, I can't not play. You know, there, there's an attraction to it. You know, later on I started to talk about it being the sound of liberation or the sound of freedom to me, that, you know, I could do things with the guitar. Um, but the, you're right, that there's, there's a problem in, in as much as, you know, in those days in the Detroit public schools there were music programs. And um, I think music programs have all but disappeared in public education along with public education that's disappeared <laughs> in public education. <laughs> <laughs> we're building jails, but uh, we're not we're not so good on the schools. Mm. So you know, I think that you know, music has, from the beginning of time, always had an important role to play in in human experience, and uh, uh, you know, uh, the kind of work that that uh, that we do um, is is just trying to you know champion that you know to to keep it in the forefront of people's thoughts you know that that art is important you know the, these are the stories of who we are this confirms um, uh, uh, our existence hmm. you know makes makes me feel like you know what I'm not the only nutcase out here you hmm. know I'm not alone when I listen to James Brown he's singing that to me that's my song he's singing hmm. and I'm connecting with James Brown just like with you know Picasso and Guernica or or any art form so we, I just think, I think art's hugely important. Um, I, I'm, I've started as a piano player. My mom, when, uh, when she was pregnant with me, the legend had it, she played piano every day and her belly was against the keyboard. I started playing piano when I was three. I was already like picking out, I had some version of Louie Louie by the time I was three, just playing these chords over and over. Um, I became, <clears throat> around four or five years old, obsessed with a song by, um, uh, oh God, it's a song called Last Date, um, and it's by, who's it? Floyd Kramer. Floyd Kramer, yeah. Do you, I don't know if you know the song, amazing song, but I listened to it, I mean, my babysitter, I think, wanted to kill me, because I would just play it over and over. Um, I, was, I, I would just put my head against the speaker and just listen to it over and over. Uh, at some point, I discovered rock and roll, there was some I grew up in Glover Park, just up the hill here, and there was kids, Georgetown University kids, like hippie kids who lived in a group house. Um, and I remember going and seeing their record collection. They had like this many records, and I, I was like shaking because they had so many records. And, um, and uh, I just started, you know, I heard the Beatles, obviously, and, and Janis Joplin was hugely important to me, um, and uh, the Rolling Stones, and this sort of thing. And then, at some point, Woodstock, um, I saw Woodstock in probably 72 or 73. I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And then I became obsessed with Woodstock. Uh, and when my family would drive, I was always staring out the window, scouting for a location for my like, concert and making lists of the bands that I would want to have play. And of course, Jimi Hendrix was always at the top, though he was actually dead. And um, <laughs> which is big, big, no number big enough to get him out for that gig. But the... Um, um, but <laughs> But I, I was, I, like, the Hendri Hendrix and then the Who, like, seeing them play in Woodstock and then in Monterey Pop, and I thought, I want to play guitar. Because piano, it's hard to swing and break a piano on stage, right? It's very hard. So I thought I would, and also it's just not aggressive in the same way, at least at the time. So my mom uh, hired a neighborhood bully to teach me how to play guitar. Um, partly because he played in a band, also because she figured if she was paying him, then he wouldn't beat me up, which worked out pretty well. Um, and he taught me how to play Smoke on the Water on one string, um, but the, the guitar was a piece of junk, and uh, I'd never, I couldn't, it couldn't transpose the piano to guitar. It just didn't make any sense to me. So I gave up, really, on the idea of actually playing guitars, and instead, we would just shoplift small plastic guitars and practice breaking them. Um, and then... <laughs> get right to the good part. Yeah, that just seemed like, yes, get to it, yeah. Anyway, so then in high school, 
I mean, then I just became a skateboarder. That's what, you know, this mid-70s, I was like, skateboarding just seemed like a perfect place for me. It was, it was radical, it was visionary. Um, it taught me how to redefine the world around me. Suddenly, like everything on the streets, I had a whole different relationship with it. Uh, and then s punk rock kind of came into the picture. And I had tried out for one band, a band, a high school band called Frozen Heat. Um, great name. And they were a cover band, and I played, they want me to play organ, and I tried playing organ. We did Sunshine of Your Love, and my whole part was, you know, there you go, you go, how's it go? Dun, 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 dun. And I would go, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I said, okay, I'm not playing organ, I'm not playing keyboards. And when I got into punk, it was like, I could play bass. I could play Smoke on the Water on one string. That was no problem. See, and then punk rock just made it possible. I saw the Cramps um, at Hall of Nations, one block from here, just around the corner. Uh, and seeing that show completely changed my life. And once I started to understand that music, you can come at it however you want. I think prior to that, in the 70s, the idea was that you had to be of some particular stock, you know, of some strata to actually play music. But punk actually said anybody can do it. And that's how I discovered bands like this guy's band and stuff that just were just incredible. So I, it just it was just guitar and then anything after that. I'm trying to figure out how to play a trombone now. It's very hard. <laughs> very hard. Uh, somebody over there has got a, their hand up right there. Oh. Thanks. Um, I love hearing your path to your instruments and how you started. Can you, can you keep going with that and talk about um, how writing your own original music fit in? When did you start doing that? How does, how does that feel? And also, as, as someone who writes songs myself too, I'm just curious what you're writing now. Um, well, like everybody else, I started learning my, my heroes, how they played. So I would, I would sit with Chuck Berry records and play them over and over and over. I, I don't know how my mother withstood it. Um, just the repetition, you know. Um, but it just became obvious to me at a certain point I, had a, I was playing in bands that um, in order to kind of, um, you know, that it really wasn't about learning everybody else's songs, that I had to write my own songs. And that also seemed to be the key to, because uh, when I grew up in Detroit, like, to work, if you wanted to work in music, you could work in bars. And in, when you worked in bars, you worked five sets a night, 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off, and you had to play what they called top 10. And, you know, I did it for a number of years, and it was big fun for a while, but it started to really get to be a grind, and I, I wanted to be the guys that played at, you know, in the auditoriums and, and went on tour and not play on Michigan Avenue in a bar. And I, it, I'm, I'm really sharp sometimes. I figured out those guys write their own songs. So Wayne, you need to write your own songs. And so that was the beginning of that, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and then it was just a process of, you know, what, what sounds do I connect with? You know, what kind, of, what kind of melodies, what kind of chords? I had learned enough at that point to know how to assemble chords and how they would fit together and how the melody would run through them. Um, and, you know, that's a process that never ends. And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still learning how to write songs. I, I, I'll still find somebody else's composition, learn, analyze theirs, figure out how they did it, what their melody was, and then try to, try to come up with something on my own. The stuff I'm writing now, uh, I'm, I just finished a jazz album, which was a, a free jazz album for a score for a film called uh, The Narcotic Farm for PBS, um, because I'm a huge jazz fan and, and I've always had an interest in um, uh, progressive, you know, free jazz. Um, but right now I'm working on a little album. I, I just want to make a little record, of, you know, and maybe acoustic, something that I can just get in a car and drive around the country and play by myself. Um, that, that sounds like that would be fun to me, to play in a club. And you know, I've just been fooling with doing solo acoustic gigs. And um, it's interesting because then, you know, people can hear the jokes. 
Right. You know, <laughs> when you're with a band, you know, everybody's like, ah, and right. they never hear what you're actually saying. But when it's just you and the guitar, they can they can connect with the with the story you're trying to tell. So that that's the kind of stuff that that I'm working on. I think uh, for, for me, I, I actually was incapable of playing other people's music. That was sort of a part of the problem. I couldn't understand how other music was being made. I mean, if you're growing up around like Peter Frampton and and the Eagles, you're like, how does how do they do this? It doesn't make any. I mean, I couldn't make any sense out of how this instrument and my hands could get anywhere near that stuff. And it wasn't necessarily good. It was just it'd be like watching, uh, you know, it's like seeing a movie or something. You can't, and you have a Super 8 camera, and it just doesn't make any sense how these two things relate. Um, now, I did actually figure out, again, Smoke on the Water or Stepping Stone, which was an enormously important song. It was a monkey song. And then hearing the Sex Pistols do other cover songs was really striking because you realize they, were, they had their style, but they were doing other people's songs. I never even thought about a cover song prior to that um, in terms of making it your own song. In my high school, of course, everybody, all the bands did only cover songs with occasionally one or two originals, which were invariably like terrible blues jams. Like that was they were always blues jams. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a song called Broken Heart Blues. And you're like, oh no, like you know. Um, so when we formed the first band I was in was a band called the Slinkies, um, and that's right. Shout out for the Slinkies. Um, we played one show, and we almost didn't play the show because the guy's house. He had made his mom mad, and she canceled the show. And then I wrote, her, I wrote her a letter to tell her to please, you know, hey, we worked really hard. And she said, I'm a psychiatrist. You can't trick me with your manipulative bullshit. And, and, um, but we did the show. So I did trick her with my manipulative bullshit. Um, and, um, but the, uh, we just wrote our own songs. And I remember everybody said, like, you, oh, we're in a, you said, you're in a band. Um, we're in a band. And they're like, oh, what songs do you do? What covers? And we said, we write our own songs. And they're like, whoa, like, okay, get away from me. Because it didn't make any sense to them that you would write your own songs. But that was punk rock. It just, mm -hmm. you could do anything. The first song I wrote, I think, was a song, maybe it was a song called Trans Am, which was about um, these guys who drove around cars and thought they were badass because they had badass cars or something. Or, and then you know, I wrote a song like Get Up and Go. And I just wrote anything. You know, we, you know, we just wrote songs. Um, for me, it was always a collaborative process. I always like writing with other people. I've always enjoyed that process. Um, and what I like about it is that I'm, what I do is I basically, I, again, less options. So I create a situation in which like in Fugazi, I played for 15 years. I had one guitar, one kind of guitar, one cable, and one amp. No effects. And my idea was like, what can I get out of this guitar? What, how can I manipulate? How can I approach this instrument to get different sounds to keep it interesting to me? And now in this band, the Evens that I'm playing in, I'm playing a baritone guitar, which is a really, it's not a guitar. It's a different kind of instrument. And it, it's a, I'm playing, it's a two-piece. It's a drummer and a baritone guitar player. Um, which is me, and two singers. Uh, and we have, it really forces you to think, like, how can you make this sound like, like, how can it sound good? How can it sound rich? By lessening the options, it forces me to try to be creative. And that's, that's songwriting for me. And occasionally, um, my hands will just start playing something. And then my brain will say, it must become a song. And if I understood what that process would be, I would have put out a lot more albums by now. But I don't understand it. It just happens. And I think, are we, how are we, for, are we okay? Stop! That's what his sign says, stop. Thanks. Yay. <laughs> Yay! Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Wayne. All right, um, so our, our next thing on our schedule is a conversation about Sweet Home New Orleans and the work in New Orleans. Um, I'm just going to take a couple seconds to get everybody up here. <laughs> 